I'm driving right now, 1916 Packard Twin Six. Absolutely astonishing to think that it's only 17 years since James Packard first marketed his initial car, a one cylinder in 1899, to this amazing technological marvel. You know, the fun thing is, the car industry is a lot like the computer industry is now. It was moving so quickly. I mean, the Model T was a four cylinder. This was a 12. This is the epitome of a smoothness and quiet and drivability, yet you still had two-wheel brakes, but when this car came out, the speed limit was maybe 40 miles an hour at, no, not 40, probably not 40. Eight, about 18, 18 miles an hour was the speed limit. But of course, the roads were empty, and so you had, you had the opportunity to use all the performance that you had without worrying about a lot of traffic around right. you. And of course, to think about using a car like this in the environment of, of Newport, Rhode yeah. Island, back when this car was new, must have been absolutely amazing. And the fun thing is, it's really still a handsome car. I mean, oh. obviously it looks like an old car, but proportionate-wise, it's just such a beautiful design. Everything flows into everything else. It's not ungainly or ugly. I mean, it really... Even today, people would stop and stare at this car. Absolutely, this car is magnificent. Um, as you said, the form of the car, and of course, this Roadster is a very rare model. There are only 40 of them made, and it's believed that only four still exist. Yeah. But this engine was the mainstay of the Packard line. This was their luxury engine. This is the engine that inspired Enzo Ferrari, isn't it? It is indeed, and of course, we know what the V12 engine ended up being to Ferrari, the idea of multiple cylinders, 12 cylinders, 16 cylinders, the idea of smoothness through a smaller cylinder rather right. than these huge pots just making power. I think that it also is the start of a more sophisticated way of approaching putting power on the road. I remember David E. Davis from Car and Driver and Automobile Magazine, his mantra was everyone should drive a 12 cylinder car at least once in their life. And it's really true, the turbine smoothness how quiet it is, they're perfectly balanced, they're just wonderful, wonderful engines. Absolutely astonishing. And again, as you said, the, the idea of the, the rush of technology at this time is so amazingly exciting that we are transported, literally, as, as we enjoy so much, the way cars are time machines. Right. And this is literally a time machine. The fact that we are here in 2020 enjoying this car in the way that the builders intended it to be enjoyed. Right, exactly. I mean, compared, compared to a Model T, this is like a Ferrari <laughs> and a Pinto, isn't it? Exactly. Thinking about the, the contrast in what was available at the top end of the market and the lower end of the market is absolutely astonishing because cars were, at this time, still basically the playthings of the wealthy. Right. Model T had just begun to bring motoring to a wider public. Right. So you see that the contrast between what was available in this super deluxe end of the market right. in terms of comfort and, and, and features. I mean, we've got multiple lights. We've got this wonderful Waltham clock, a Warner speedometer, gauges for gasoline, oil level, all these things that the Ford driver could only dream of. Right, right. But they're all here in this, in this Packard. A really comfortable seat. It's a really comfortable wide cockpit as well. Right, right. You know, this is a car that you could spend time in. And even on the, 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 uh, the primitive roads of the time, this still must have been a wonderful driving experience. Oh, yeah. And you've got good acceleration, too. Yeah. The engine seems to respond almost instantly to your throttle pressure. Yeah. Uh, top speed on this car is probably about 65 miles an hour, which was a mile a minute, which was like a crazy speed back in the day. Exactly. 
I know that you uh, love telling the story about your father I know. always looking down at the speedometer saying, You got a mile away! Crazy? You got a mile away! Pop, the speed limit 65, don't worry about it. But you know, those psychological things, like a mile a minute. Right. Um, and as we're about to see in the house that we're going to uh, visit in just a moment, Miramar, also around this time, the idea of an unsinkable ship. Right. You know, these are all absolutely possible because these are the technological wonders that are being delivered to yeah. us by great engineers. Yeah, yeah. When you realize in 1916, most Americans had never sat in an automobile. The average American, probably not. There was no telephone yet. Well, there was some, but not, yeah. not widespread. Telephone, the electric light, things that were available, but not constant. Is the house we're going to right up here? The house we're going to is right up here. You'll see the gate in a moment. And it's an amazing place. Well, I should think about braking now, because it's yeah, only has brakes on the rear wheel. Exactly. Planning ahead wasn't as necessary back when this car was new as it is now. And this is about the speed people would go, isn't it? Yeah. 18, 20 miles an hour. Especially like in that. town, yeah. when generally the speed limits were a walking pace. Right. Here we are at Miramar. I'm surprised that the gate isn't wider. Usually cars are so much bigger back then. They were huge things. Yeah, it's true, but I guess they didn't have to worry about it because the it was up to the chauffeur to figure out how to negotiate right. the gates. I guess that's true. Wow, this is another beautiful house. This is an absolutely amazing house. And when place. was this one built? This house was completed in 1915. Oh, wow, but it's the same as the Packard. About so the same as the Packard. you got your new house and you pull up in your brand new car. Exactly. And this Packard would have been absolutely right at home when brand new here at Miramar. Oh, yeah, you were Jack the Lad with this thing. Absolutely extraordinary home. Wow, what a house. the Widener family of Philadelphia. And a beautiful house with a beautiful story and a slightly tragic one as well. Welcome to Miramar. Wow, what a place. I'd rather have the car. <laughs> I'll take the car and the house. So here we are at Miramar. Right. This is an amazing house designed by uh, Horace Trumbauer, who also designed the Elms here in uh, Newport, for George Widener of Philadelphia. And George Widener and his son Harry and his wife were on the Titanic in wow. April 1912. And of course, George and his son Harry went down on the ship. They were also, George was also a part owner of the White Star Line, the line, of course, that owned the Titanic. Sure. So there was no question that he would not give up his place to be rescued in, in place of one of the passengers. And so his wife, Eleanor, came back to the US and completed this house, which was finished in 1915. Hmm. Miramar truly embodies what has been described as the rich simplicity of Horace Trombauer's work. A faithful expression of the 18th century French neoclassical style, Miramar sits in terraced gardens and was his last complete large-scale residential project in Newport. All combines to present an ordered, calm, simple elegance that takes perfect advantage of its sighting, equidistant from Bellevue Avenue and the Atlantic Ocean. A formal arrangement of rooms with large French doors open to the west, north, and south-facing gardens and the ocean to the east giving what is a very formal home a sense of 20th century indoor-outdoor living. The landscape comes into every room. The house was being planned when George and Eleanor Widener traveled to Europe in early 1912 on a short trip to find a chef for a hotel Widener owned. Their son Harry, a passionate rare book collector, went along to visit some dealers in London. It was a short trip, only a few weeks, and they booked passage back on the Titanic's maiden voyage. Eleanor Elkins Widener completed the design with Trumbauer after the tragedy and lived here with her two surviving children. In honor of Harry, she established the Widener Library at Harvard and commissioned Trumbauer to design the building. Eleanor continued to enjoy life at Miramar with her second husband, Alexander Hamilton Rice. It has only had three owners from the time it was built. Newport has the distinction of being home to more of Trumbauer's surviving work than any other place, no fewer than 10 of the 12 homes he designed are still here. The city truly celebrates this somewhat unsung genius. Hmm. And it's an astonishing thing because it's such an incredibly beautiful, elegant, clean house. And you can just see how this Packard would have been perfectly at home in front of this house. You know, it's funny. I was just looking at this motor meter. And what this does is this reads the temperature of the engine. Now, I have a 1913 Packard, which was considered at the time 
the, the first modern Packard. It had the steering wheel on the left. It had all the controls in front of the driver. Uh, it, it had electric start, and it did not have the motor meter because it would not overheat. You did not have to worry about that. But of course, like most things it did, they got a little overconfident. And by 15, they went back to this again because either that or drivers wanted to know the temperature of their motor. They just needed to know that before it was, you know, overflowing and, and flooding the street. You know. Overconfidence in engineering. Yeah. Some say Titanic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but pretty amazing. It's an astonishing thing to think about how technology progressed at such a pace that people's faith in technology was probably firmer then than it is today. As, as many technological advances that we live with on an everyday basis and take for granted, then technology was a wonder, a marvel that could solve any problem and cure any ill. Yeah, and, but you know, people still do. My, one of my favorite scenes in the TV show Breaking Bad, you know, with... Uh, uh, Walter White, is the, mm -hmm. he was a science teacher who made meth when he had a student and they were trapped and the police were coming. The student said, oh, well, can't you build a robot or something to get us out of here? I mean, earnestly saying that as if technology, you snap your fingers and things would happen. And it was like that back in this period too. There were, there were con men that used to drive around the country convincing people they had a car that ran on water. And what they would do is they would fill the frame rails with gasoline with hidden lines and then they'd put the hose in the gas tank and then drive away and farmers and you know sort of people in small towns were amazed so they'd buy his 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 deal to convert it and of course it never never worked but he was in the next town by the time that happened yeah. now talking about technology you can rely on let's take a look at this magnificent right. 12 cylinder engine i mean it really is i mean look at that absolutely gorgeous it is, again, a wonderful marvel of the fact that the industrial age was a time when craftsmen, designers, made their products look as good as they worked. Right, right. Yeah, just a beautiful, beautiful. And it looks extremely complex, especially for the period. Right. We look at a Model T, it's basically like a tractor. But this, look at that distributor with the 12 uh, spark plugs. I'm mean, just unbelievable. And again, this is one of those things that you like to talk about a lot, about the role of the chauffeur. The chauffeur in this day had a lot of work to do after every drive and before every drive. And you know what's interesting? Americans sort of get the short under the stick that the European stuff is so sophisticated. Uh, to me, the roles that we'll look at in a minute, it's a nice car, but I think it's a triumph of build quality over engineering. I mean, this is very sophisticated. That's very traditional, but so extremely well made that it's reliable. Would you agree? I would agree entirely. Yeah. And it's interesting. Let's go take a look at that uh, Rolls Royce right now. Now here's something I find interesting. If you took a person who knew nothing about cars and said, which one of these was the more modern car? I think you'd pick the 16 Packard with the 12 cylinder engine and it's racier looking, it's more stylish. This is 15 years newer than that. And this actually looks like the older car to me. It does in so many ways, Jay. I mean, this is an amazingly beautiful example of a 1929 Rolls Phantom One, and it's a Springfield Phantom, so built in Springfield, Massachusetts, not terribly far from where we are in Newport, Rhode Island, and bodied by the Murphy Company of Pasadena, California. And it's a one-off design, the only one like this in the world, and it has a certain amount of dash and style, but in the way of sort of a dowager getting a new haircut. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, to me, I look at the hood. There's no louvers, there's no design on the hood. It's strictly functional. It could be a truck hood, really. I mean, it, it, I mean the back of the car sort of saves it, this part here. But the front, I mean, look at the hood of the Packard. It's got curves, it flows, it's got all the louvers. You know, it's laying the air, it's functional. This, this has no louvers to let the hot air out at, at all. So it all goes into the fo uh, footwell here for the driver. Well, if Sir has a problem with hot air coming from Sir's engine compartment, perhaps Sir needs to drive his car a bit faster. Sometimes Sir has a problem with his co-host, who can <laughs> often be that way. <laughs> but let's, let's move on. But it's a very interesting thing. One of the reasons why this car is here today at Miramar is the fact that the owners of Miramar were very partial to Rolls-Royces and kept a stable of Phantom Ones 
here on the yeah. property in the carriage house. And we should explain, these were built in Springfield, Massachusetts for tax reasons. Yes. Uh, much like today when we suddenly decide we're going to tax France or tax somebody else, there was a huge tax on cars from England. So England came over here and started building them in America in Springfield, Massachusetts and Chicopee and all around that area using local craftsmen to avoid paying the, the tariff. Exactly. And today, they're incredibly collectible, not only for Americans, but there are a number of Europeans as well that like the cachet of a Springfield Rolls Royce. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it's a very interesting uh, thing. And again, part of the Newport lifestyle, you can just see this car wafting down Ocean Drive and going to the casino. And it's know. very New Englandy. When I worked at Foreign Motors in Boston, we had a man there who was given one of these, but a Roadster, in uh, 1921 for his birthday. He was the longest owner of a Rolls Royce. He had it 70 years, something like that. He lived to his 90s. So the Piccadilly Roadster? Yeah, Piccadilly Roadster, yes. that's right. And he was a fascinating gentleman. And he would bring it in for service, and he was like 94, and he, it was amazing. It was amazing. It's just the classic sort of New England, you know, old money, all that kind Your of stuff. Your car works? Why would you ever trade it yeah, in for his, a newer model? His dad gave it to him for his 21st birthday, and it's the only car he had. Absolutely astonishing. And thinking about what stood for quality through the ages, we talked about the 1916 Packard. We're now at the beginning of the Great Depression with the 1929 Rolls Phantom One, but we're going to go to the modern age and what was, in another time, the standard of the world for American cars. Exactly. A 1964 Cadillac. Let's take a look. So a 1964 Cadillac DeVille convertible. And this looks like a Cadillac. You could park this anywhere in the world. Germany, France, England, the middle of Africa, Japan, and people would know, well, it must be an American car because it's got that confidence, I guess. Absolutely, the presence, the sheer presence that American cars of the 1950s and 60s have, and the ones from the 60s have that presence, but with a clean style. None of the excesses in styling that you had in the 19. Uh, 50s, and this car shows how expensive it is in a very quiet way. Again, much like our 1916 Packard, it doesn't have to shout. It just says, I'm here. Yeah, but it does kind of shout. It's got an enormous, well, the biggest engine you could get just about in the world. A 429 cubic inch V8, which was, you know, we all counted cubic inches back there. The Hemi was 426, you know. The uh, Pontiac's 420, this was 429. 429, 340 horsepower. Yeah. There's a big and heavy car, but it would move, that's yeah. for sure. And, and reliable. I mean, big V8, big alternator, air conditioner, drivetrain, um, transmission, rear end. I mean, traditional as they come, but, and dead reliable. These were great cars. Technology, you can count on. I yeah. see a theme here. Yeah. The other thing is that, again, here in Newport and at Miramar, this is a car that says effortless style. Yeah. And in a way that cars later would really force themselves to, you know? This is a car that still feels perfectly natural in this environment. Um, it's not embarrassed, it's, it's confident, it's, it's luxurious, and it's not ashamed of it at all. No, no, and I love the thin steering wheel. That's my favorite Fingertip thing. controls. Yeah, fingertip controls. And they bragged about the complete absence of road feel. You power brake, you touch everything, it was like magic fingers, you know, it was all of that. Steer it with two fingers, yeah, hilarious. Steer it with two fingers. The effortless control, the fingertip steering, the uh, power window switches that with lightning speed would elevate a window absolutely silently, of course, slicing fingers off sometimes, but right. you know, these are the kind of things that in a European car, think of a 1964 Mercedes-Benz with roll-up windows and no air conditioning right. for half again as much money as this Cadillac cost. Right. You know, I had two guys call me and say, we're driving an antique car from Florida to California, and we want to end in your garage and take a picture. Could we do that? They're all excited about this. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. I said, what kind of antique car are you driving? They said, a 68 Cadillac. And I go, my <laughs> father did that trip. Like, guys, it's not an adventure. That's just a car trip. They go, no, the car's almost 50 years old. I go, no, but that, that's, that's a modern car. That's not an antique car. Well, it was antique to them, and it just made me laugh. But think about it, Jay, the adventure in driving a 1968 Cadillac across the country is how often could you find gas stations? Yeah, yeah. 
that's about right. You know, if you're buying your car by the pound, this is the way to go, baby. Absolutely. Longer, leaner, lower, wider. <laughs> Driving here towards the beach in Newport in this uh, Cadillac DeVille convertible is uh, very much in the spirit of the motoring that Newport's all about. Well, you know what's funny? Maybe it's because I grew up with these kind of cars. It doesn't feel like an old car to me. It feels like an old pair of shoes. It's comfortable. This is what I know. I know people under 40 who get this some lights and go, oh my God, it's frightening to drive. It's so big, I don't know where. But to me, it just, it seems fine. These are the cars that we first learned to drive on. Right. We parallel park these cars without thinking about That's it. That's right. You know, and uh, it is it is a very strange thing to think about how cars have evolved. Oh yeah. And uh, it's it's again the fact that you have a car like this Cadillac, which offers an experience totally unlike that of a contemporary car, but is still so usable. You know that I think makes a classic like this so much fun to have. Oh yeah, and this is the car the rich guy's beautiful daughter had in high school, you know, and she'd go through the drive through waving, kind of like the Beach Boys fun, fun, fun song with the T-Bird, you know. Exactly. And today, a car like this is remarkably affordable. So for those people that think that collector cars are only for the super rich and, and, and not for them, a car like this can give you amazing, amazing experiences yeah. for not very much money. Yeah, unless you try to put gas in it. Well, yes, probably the most expensive part of running this a car like is this probably is gas. A hundred dollar fill up minimum. Absolutely. And that'll get you at eh, 200 and something miles. So, yeah. Well, it's still a really special experience and- And they something... make great planters. <laughs> so driving down Bellevue Avenue in this 1964 Cadillac convertible DeVille is absolutely extraordinary. It feels very much a part of the ride that we took in that 1916 Packard, but in a totally different context. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. That's true. That's probably true. The smoothness, the luxury, the effortless performance that that Packer gave in 1916, this Cadillac gave in 1964. Yeah, so that Packard in Sig, when this 64, that would be like what? That Us Packard driving a car from what year? That Packard would be driving a car from, in, driving that Packard in 1950. Yeah. No, yeah. no, what I mean is, what I mean is this, this car, a 64 is how many years from 16? Let me see. Ah, from 16. Ah, it's uh, 50 years. 50 years. 50 years. Yeah, yeah I guess it is. It's yeah. about 50 years. Yeah, yeah. A new Cadillac versus this, about the same exactly. time, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And so it's, it's uh, extraordinary well, how much has changed and yet how little has changed. That's right. When you realize <laughs> in 1916, this had, uh, it, had a cat, it had a carburetor. You know, internal combustion engine or right. carburetor, a lot of it was the same. Well, you know, I've, I've long believed, and I know that you, with your hands-on experience working on cars, just about everything that we experience in a car today was invented by 1905 or 1910. Right. It's all been a refinement sure. of those sort of seminal inventions. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I'll bet a mechanic that, that grew up uh, wrenching on that 1916 Packard would probably open the hood of the 64 Cadillac and know his way around. Yeah, I figured it out pretty quickly. Well, Jay, I think that our experience today at Miramar with the 1916 Packard, the 1929 Rolls-Royce, and this 1964 Cadillac DeVille convertible just shows the essence of Newport. Yeah. Great houses, great cars, wonderful experience on the road. Yeah, and I think old cars and old houses are much more fun and much more exciting than new cars and new houses. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. There you go. History is being made every day, every moment, as we drive and as they live in these great houses. There you go. See you next time, folks.